we are recording. Okay, great. Hi. Well, yeah, I'll let Mandy start it off. Okay, uh, welcome. We've got some folks trickling in, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get started for our next installment of the Alaska Wildlife Alliance's virtual Wildlife Wednesday presentations. And tonight we are going to learn about being an ethical wildlife photographer. And then this is also our first presentation where we have a component that's a career spotlight. So through our season, the rest of the year, we're going to have a few of our speakers also talking a little bit about how, uh, what steps you can take to become that particular wildlife related career. But before we jump in, Carl, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about some of the guidelines we're doing for this uh, presentation. And I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Mandy Magura, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. And I'll be the moderator during this session today. So you may notice that when you logged in, we went ahead and disabled your cameras and your audio. Um, that's to preserve bandwidth uh, so we get a, a smoother transmission of the presentation tonight, but also to prevent any Zoom bombing, any accidental sounds interrupting or any visuals. And if you're new to Zoom, we encourage that you view the presentation in full screen mode. If you don't know what that is, look for that little picture frame symbol. Um, if you're on the computer, I think it's in the upper right hand side next to speaker view. And then we're going to let Carl go through his entire presentation tonight. And then we will address questions at the end. And the way we're going to do present uh, questions is that you can put your question into the chat box. Um, and you can do that anytime during the presentation, but we will address it at the end of the presentation. So feel free as a question comes up to go ahead and um, put it in the chat box so you don't forget about it later and we'll get to it at the end. And then most importantly, you know, we hope that you learned something new. I've seen a sneak preview of this. There are just some amazing photos um, and it's a really engaging talk that Carl's giving us tonight. So um, next slide, please, Carl. I wanna go ahead and turn you over to Nicole Schmidt and she is our executive director to talk to you a little bit about the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. Thanks, Mandy and Carl and everyone joining us from all corners of the internet. Um, as Mandy said, my name is Nicole and uh, I'm with the Alaska Wildlife Alliance as is Mandy and we have been advocating for Alaska's wildlife um, since 1978, which for Alaska is, is pretty long. We haven't been a state for that long. Um, and our mission is to have ecosystem-based management for biodiversity of Alaska's wildlife. So um, that includes a compromised view between hunting and conservation um, and making sure that all Alaskans benefit from our amazing wildlife, including photographers. Um, so uh, we are part of uh, Amazon Smile and Roundup. We're also on Pick, Click, Give. Thank you to the Alaskans who have donated part of their PFD through Pick, Click, Give. And we're also a member of the Combined Federal Campaign. So if you see our name in any of those venues, we would love to see your support. Uh, Carl, I think the next slide will work. Great, we're on Facebook um, and we have, we think some pretty fun posts. Uh, we have uh, different games, Trivia Tuesday, but uh, we also have some of the heavier stuff. So all the latest wildlife news that we um, have access to, we publish, we give you action alerts and ways to stay involved. And that's also available through our e-newsletter and you can sign up for that online. But um, Give us a follow on Facebook if you're interested in staying up to date. Thanks, Carl. And part of our mission um, is to educate about wildlife and also uh, bring people into the fold on some advocacy issues that you can do from home um, to speak up for Alaska's wildlife. And there are a few really important ones coming up especially this month due in, in just a couple of days. The Board of Game is having a special meeting regarding um, bear hunting opportunities for spring of 2021 in the Alaska Peninsula, which you can see on that map. Um, and 
uh, there are some very concerning biological issues with having three years of consecutive hunts that has not been done since the 1970s because of a declining bear population in that area. So um, this week we are posting a fact sheet and information. So stay tuned on our website and please comment to the Board of Game by the 27th um, if you can. And next slide, Carl. And another opportunity, um, you might remember that last spring, the Supreme Court um, decided in a hovercraft case <laughs> concerning navigable waterways that hovercrafts could be used in national parks. And uh, so this year, um, there is a proposed regulation to provide clarity on the definition of navigable waterways within national park lands in Alaska. And that is open for public comment until June 29th. Um, and we'll have more information in early June as that comes up, but keep that on your radar for um, an issue to comment on later as we go down the road. Um, and next slide, Carl. Thanks. And uh, in case you missed it, we've had virtual Wildlife Wednesdays every week that, or yes, every week this month. Um, and we've been recording them like we're recording this one tonight. So we've had belugas in our backyard, bears of the Alaska Peninsula. Um, we also have a documentary we're working on about Denali. And then we have some upcoming Wildlife Wednesdays. Um, next week is about Canada geese. And then in June, we have a career spotlight on wildlife veterinary pathology. So lots of different topics and stay tuned. We love to see you all at these talks. Next slide. Great. And last, I think, uh, thank you to all. Last week was Endangered Species Week, and we had a match for $1,500 that we met. So thank you so much for supporting our work to protect our most vulnerable species in Alaska. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And next slide, Carl. Okay, great. Well, with all of our organizational stuff uh, out of the way, I'm really, really excited to introduce you all to Carl Johnson. Um, so I think of Carl as just this jack of all trades. You've done pretty much everything. <laughs> um, but more recently, uh, Carl is the owner of Alaska Photo Treks. And he's been photographing Alaska's wildlife landscapes for decades, I think over 20 years. And during that time, um, digital photography and social media interactions have um, really increased the prolification of photography, um, especially of Alaska's wildlife. And um, while many people are very eager to get these great shots, um, they rarely think of how their photography might impact their subjects. And this is something that Carl has been very passionate about and uh, is a resident expert in. So we're very excited to have you. And Carl, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. And it's great to hear all the work that the Alaska Wildlife Alliance is doing. And I thank you for the opportunity to give you this presentation and be a part of your Wildlife Wednesdays. Um, it is kind of a really interesting thing how much the combination of digital photography and social media have really transformed wildlife photography and nature photography as well in the last, even just the last 15 years or so. And a lot of, a lot of what drives um, people's interests nowadays kind of leaves behind some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight. People really don't think about ethics in wildlife photography very much. So that's why I wanted to give a little bit of a talk about this. And it's, it's really a pleasure and a treat to live in a place like Alaska where <clears throat> we have these massive moose and we have the largest subspecies of moose in the world. We have all these amazing large critters from polar bears and brown bears to wolves and, and muskox and caribou. People come from all over the world to photograph these animals here. And I'll leave off, I know some you know fellow Alaskan photographers who like to travel to Africa 
to photograph their wildlife, but there's just still so many of them here for me to photograph. I, I, I'm still, you know, getting caught up on that. But it's easy to um, get out there and photograph, um, which is why I really wanted to make this presentation. And a lot of people ask, well, what does it take to be a really good wildlife photographer? First and foremost, if you're going to be an ethical wildlife photographer, you will become an excellent wildlife photographer. You will develop quality images because your images are derived from understanding and respecting your subject. And like with most nature photography subjects, the first things first, if you want to be good at it, you need to learn to be a naturalist. And that is you need to learn about the animal. You need to learn about its habitats, its behaviors, uh, what motivates it, where does it go for food, where does it go for water, how does that behavior change with the seasons? How does identification change with the seasons? You know, we have four different animals in Alaska that turn white in the wintertime. What are those? And when do those changes happen? Why do those changes happen? <clears throat> And more importantly, and I get a little bit later when we're talking about how we're interacting with wildlife when we're close to them, what sounds or what visual cues does the animal give to show alarm, to show that you are disturbing them and stressing them? And these are all really important things to know. And, and lastly, what does the animal do? What's its motivation? So these are all good things to know. Um, and it helps you to understand then where are you going to find things, what to expect, when to expect it, uh, what kind of behavior you can see, learning how to identify, you know, what, what kind of chick is that? Uh, I don't see an adult nearby. What kind of chick is that? Is it, um, you know, juvenile plumage or is it winter plumage? Now, there's a lot of great stuff you can find on the internet, but in many ways, I'm old school. and I've kind of developed a collection of books that I've found really useful. There's some good general information out there. Naturalist Guide to the Arctic is a great resource to have. Uh, this is also the Guide to Animal Tracking and Behavior is another kind of good general book that is useful to help identify things like, what on earth is this imprint in the snow of this image? Well, that's willow ptarmigan, right? Interesting. Uh, it's a really beautiful pattern, but uh, there's all kinds of neat things that animals do. And once you learn how to identify tracks, then that helps you better understand what is happening and what's going on. Now for birds, there's just a ton of bird guides out there. If you're into birding, these are ones that I have in my collection. <clears throat> of course, for Alaska, the Guide to Birds of Alaska uh, by Robert Armstrong is a classic. It's very much the go-to guide for Alaskan bir birds. But whenever I'm traveling and I'm photographing wildlife in other locations, I like to get local resources from there. Um, sometimes the, the sticker price might be a little high, like when I purchased this Icelandic birds book when I was in Iceland. I thought 50 bucks was expensive. I came back and I found out that if I want to buy it on Amazon, it's $150. So buying local has its advantages. Now, of course, we have great resources that are local knowledge for our wildlife. And specifically, you know, Vic Van Ballenberge, who was a longtime wildlife biologist who did a lot of research on the groundwork in Denali National Park. His treatise on moose, the, in, in the company of moose, is a must have if you want to understand moose behavior. For wolves, we have a lot of great resources. Uh, David Meech uh, produced uh, several treatises, one specifically about the wolves of Denali. He also studied predator prey relationships in Isle Royale National Park in Michigan. If that's a good resource as well. A lot of the principles will apply no matter where you're at, where there are wolves and their prey. And another great resource to not only understand wolves, but understand the science of studying wolves is the book Among Wolves about uh, biologist Gordon Haber who worked with the wolves in Denali National Park. But you can do a lot of studying, you can read books, you can Google, you can find YouTube videos, you can find all kinds of great stuff. But good science starts with observation. So you're gonna to want to get out there and make your own observations as part of your learning process. Now, you might just be going for a day hike or going for a bike ride, but if you're going someplace where you expect you might see wildlife, 
take along a little pack, like we all do with our food, our rain gear, or whatever else that we might want to have available, throw in it a pair of binoculars and a journal. <clears throat> so when you see something, stop and spend some time observing it. Take notes on what you're seeing it doing. If you don't know what kind of animal or bird it is right away, take notes on it, what it looked like. Like if it's a bird, how tall was it? What kind of beak did it have? What kind of coloring did it have? Did it have a black crest, a white crest? Those kinds of details. Make those observations, write them down, so that when you go back home, you can look it up and you can identify what kind of animal or what kind of bird that was, and that will help you better understand it. Just make sure that when you are doing this, that you don't get in the way of whatever it is that animal is doing, whether it's feeding, drinking, mating. Um, just don't interrupt its life cycles. Allow it to continue, and that way you're also going to get better recordings and better observation because then you're actually seeing the animal and doing its normal things. Now, when we are out there specifically either to look for wildlife or to photograph wildlife, there are some kind of good general tips for what you should do when approaching them. First things first, um, you may see this a lot uh, with hunters, but it's also a good practice if you are hunting with a lens as modeled by my friend Nick Fucci of Montana in this photo, wear earth tone and even camo clothing. That helps you blend in and not stand out. Uh, because if you're going to approach an animal, you don't want to be visible from a half a mile away. You want to be able to approach. And as you're approaching, you also won't, don't want to disturb them. You want to give yourself a chance to get closer, which means watch your step, avoid making noise, Avoid tripping on something because then you're going to drop things and you're going to yell some kind of expletive and that'll spook the animal. Uh, walk slowly in an indirect line. Don't make a beeline for them like, oh, group of caribou. I'm just going to walk as fast, as fast as I can straight towards them. That'll disturb them. It'll freak them out. Don't do it. If you can, approach from downwind. You don't want them getting a whiff of you from a great distance because, again, that's going to spoil the opportunity for you to get closer and observe them. Uh, if you are in a, with other people, speak softly in a monotone as you approach. And sometimes, actually, once you get close enough to where the animal is aware of you, I make a habit of actually talking to the animal. Again, using soft, monotone voice. Just talk to it. It obviously doesn't understand English, but it understands your tone of voice. And that's just another thing you can do to help it realize that you're not a threat. Back to the notion of not interrupting life cycles. It's really important to not disturb an animal when it's resting, particularly in the winter time. Yeah, they spend all summer and fall getting enough calories, uh, like with moose, for example, to make it through, have enough calories to get it through the fall rut and have enough energy to start with winter. And with winter, there's not as many calories available for them to eat. So you want to minimize how much they expend energy and disturbing them while they are resting is one way to expend the energy that they weren't planning to expend. Don't try to get a better shot by disturbing vegetation near a nest or a den site. If you have a twig or some grasses or something in the way, reposition. And if you still can't get a good shot, then just you're going to have to deal with what you got. Maybe wait for that animal to come out and then try to photograph it then, but don't disturb the vegetation around a nest or a den site because that's there in many cases to help protect it from predators. And speaking of den sites, don't crowd den sites. Don't leave your scent anywhere near a den site. And I have this picture in here of this red fox uh, because there is a, a den site in Anchorage that's right here in the city. A lot of people know about it. And I've photographed it a few times and uh, on many occasions, I have seen people literally standing at the entrance of the den site within a couple of feet of it. And their excuse is, well, you know, the fox are used to us. They're, well, they're saying they're habituated by their human presence, which is itself a bad thing. So try to stay away from den sites and just keep your distance and let them, you know, be safe and act normally around their den. And again, don't disturb them when they're eating. 
Uh, sometimes the act of them eating makes a great photo. So just let them do what they're doing and just wait and observe and be patient because that's one of the keys to being a good wildlife photographer along with you know, treating them with respect is just be patient. You're gonna have to spend a lot of time watching and observing wildlife to understand them, but also to get really good photos of them. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some specific behaviors, things to look for when you're photographing some of our most sought after wildlife and particularly bear and moose. So let's first talk about bears. Now Alaska, we are lucky to have these three magnificent bear species, polar bears, brown bears, and black bears. When you're photographing them, it's important not only for just identification, but to know the differences in how you behave around them, to understand the difference between a brown bear and a black bear. There are black, there are brown black bears. So there are black bears that look brown, like the same color of brown as this brown bear in the middle photo. Um, and I've seen people misidentify black bears as brown bears before. But there are certain physical properties and shapes to their bodies that are different. So it's good to know what those are. Because whether you encounter a black bear or brown bear in the wild, how you react to them will need to be different based on that particular animal. But despite the differences, there are a lot of things that are very similar about bears. They're curious. Uh, they see something out of the tundra or out in the grasses that doesn't belong there, that they are not familiar to seeing, something new in their environment, they're gonna check it out. So that's kind of their number one thing. They're curious. So a lot of the behavior is driven around that curiosity. They're also food motivated, like a lot of animals. Um, but once they come out of the den in the spring, all summer long and well into the fall, particularly when they get into this part in the fall that's called hyperphagia where they're really trying to really bulk up as much as possible on calories before they go into their den to hibernate. So you have to keep an eye out for not getting in the way of their food sources. They are very social with each other. Uh, there's a lot of interaction with bears and they can be curious but also weary of people. The best wildlife encounter you're gonna have with a bear is to encounter a bear that's kind of is kind of skittish and scurries away from you uh, rather than not being afraid of you. But again, we don't want to do things that are going to set them off, that are going to disturb them, but sometimes we do. Uh, we might surprise them, we might get closer to them than they like, and fortunately they are predictable and they have very certain patterns of communication both verbally and non-verbally where they let us know that they're not happy with us. Uh, you may have seen pictures of a brown bear yawning very classic shot. Uh, when they yawn, typically it's not for the reason that we do. We uh, yawn when we're tired, we need a little extra oxygen to our brain. A lot of times they have a non drowsy yawning, yawning that is itself a display, a stress display, letting you know that it's a little uncomfortable about you being there. They will also sometimes approach you as part of this weariness where they're trying to figure out what you are and what your purpose is. As they escalate, they will start to get more vocal with some huffing and woofing sounds, and then they'll start to get more physical, stomping the ground with their forepaws, and then sometimes even doing what's called a bluff charge. A lot of times they'll run at you. It's not a predatory attack, but it is a dominance display. They're trying to show you that they're not afraid of you, and uh, your best reaction is definitely not to run. Um, they do have some non-aggressive behavior too that some people unfortunately misinterpret as aggressive. So for example, standing up like this really cute cub here in this photo, they stand up because they really have poor eyesight and they're just trying to get a better sense of what you are uh, or their surroundings. They will also often be misinterpreted as behaving aggressively if they're just kind of meandering through the area. That's what they do. They're traveling from point A to point B. They're looking for food. They're just passing through. And unfortunately, misinterpreting this meandering through as threatening behavior got some people into trouble last year in Denali National Park, where there was a group of hikers near the Isleson Visitor Center. And there was this bear with two uh, two-year-old cubs that was passing through and they got nervous and they dumped their packs that had food in them. They left their packs behind and then the, the bear cubs got into the packs and found the food 
and then started to see humans as a food source, so that led to some problems. So just trying to understand these behaviors of bears probably even before you go out into bear country. Like most animals, you want to avoid surprising them. You want to avoid getting in the middle of between them and their food or their young. They're very protective about their young. Like we do, bears have their own personal space, so don't crowd them. And again, they're going to let you know when you're getting too close with some of these cues that I was talking about in the previous slide. You don't want to mishandle your supplies in a way that attracts bears. A good habit when you're photographing a bear country is to not put your, your day pack down the ground and, and leave it there while you're standing or sitting in a long place for, you know, place for a while. You want to always have it on your back at all times so that if a bear does come near you, you can just walk away. You don't have to reach down, pick up your pack, put it on, and then move. You're ready to go. The idea is always just plan ahead, stay calm, and if a bear does get closer to you, identify yourself. Don't identify yourself if the bear is a quarter of a mile away on the tundra. They're just passing through. They are not going to notice you unless you do something. And again, most importantly, don't run. I highly recommend that if you are going to be going out to photograph or even hike in bear country, you should take a bear safety class. They are offered by a variety of state and federal agencies. I know that the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will sometimes teach a joint bear safety class that includes a classroom session and also a session at the gun range so you can learn how to operate a 12-gauge shotgun, which is kind of one of the primary self-defense uh, weapons for um, for bears. So I really recommend that. I encourage you to do that. So for moose, uh, moose are wild, wacky critters. They're, they're funky looking, they're cute, and they're huge. Uh, a, a large adult bull moose can stand about seven feet tall at the shoulders and weigh about 1,500 pounds. So as cute as they are, they are also quite dangerous and sometimes can be aggressive. So you want to understand their behaviors. Uh, they are very vocal critters. They have a variety of different sounds, and uh, they range from this kind of whining noise you'll hear during mating season to kind of a loud nasally call. Um, they are very nonverbal. They will actually raise their hackles, their fur will raise up. I've been stalked a couple of times by moose that are kind of curious about me, and they're just kind of following me around, and I keep changing, and they keep following me. Uh, they will also rub their antlers uh, for, the, uh, for the bull moose uh, before they drop their antlers. But the real interesting time of the season for moose behavior is mating season during the autumn rut. So in the Anchorage area, that's around mid-September to mid-October. Another thing, again, back to learning the animal. When is the mating season? You know, for dull sheep, the mating season for bears, the mating season for birds. But uh, moose do a variety of things. Um, a lot of angler clashing and scraping on the ground as dominance displays to other bulls. Uh, one of my favorite behaviors is uh, a dominant bull moose will dig a hole in the ground and pee in it to attract females. Yeah, <laughs> so this is called a wallow. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about wallows later. Um, and uh, the sparring between bulls is always interesting. I have yet to see anything quite as dramatic as that one video you may have seen on Facebook of these two big bulls having this knockdown, drag out fight in the middle of a neighborhood in Anchorage. Um, but they can be aggressive. If you get again too close to them, you threaten their, their young or their, their, their food, they will act aggressively. And we have had a fatal uh, stomping by a moose in Anchorage. So as cute as they are, they can still be dangerous, and in fact, more Alaskans on average are injured by moose every year than bears. So I've been talking a lot about some of the good principles on you know, studying wildlife, learning their behaviors, observing them, approaching them, but there are some organizations that have actually published ethical guidelines that um, some photographers will, will specifically say they follow and I, these are two that I particularly follow and I, I promote on my website. First, the North American Nature Photography Association. It's a nationwide organization. It's, a, it's like $90 a year to join. It's a really worthwhile organization. And they have one of their guidelines relates specifically to knowledge of subject and place. 
these are going to sound very familiar because there are things that I've, I've talked about already. Learning about patterns of behavior, animal behavior so that you cannot interfere with their life cycles, but also it helps you better understand them and photograph them. Don't distress them or their habitat. So you need to know not only about animal behavior, but what kind of habitat are they relying on so that your actions don't disturb their habitat, the place where they live and eat. Use appropriate lenses to approach wildlife. I'll talk about that more specifically later. Uh, again, to this next part, acquaint yourself with the fragility of the ecosystem. You know, there are certain uh, types of ecosystems that are really sensitive and will have long lasting damage due to very minimal human activity. Uh, cryptobiotic soils and the desert southwest in Utah, you step on an area and you damage it for 100 years. Alpine or um, uh, Arctic tundra can also be very easily damaged in Alaska. Research your subject. Know it really well ahead of time. And don't feed live mammals in order to get good shots. Don't feed, don't use bait. Um, don't feed animals. And I'm going to get into that when I get into my bad behavior case studies later. Nature First, uh, naturefirstphotography.org. They talk a little bit more broadly, again, about us being good stewards of nature while we were out there photographing it. But the number one thing is the, 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 um, the well-being of nature should, become, should come before any of your photos. And so this is true for wildlife. The safety, well-being, and natural life cycles of an animal is much more important than you getting a really awesome photograph of that animal. Because again, if you're patient and you persevere, you can get a better photo later without disturbing it. Again, educate yourself. Think about your impact of your actions. Use the discretion if you are sharing locations. I'll give you some specific tips on that later. Always follow the leave no trace principles. If you're not familiar with that, it's definitely something you should Google and learn about. And then of course, try to do what I'm doing here today, which is actively promote these principles and educate others about them. Now, if you want to get out there and get some good wildlife images, I do have some thoughts I would like to share with you. Uh, first things first, <clears throat> take your time approaching the animal like I was talking about earlier. Indirect, slowly, no beeline for the animal. And while you're doing that, stop periodically and take pictures along the way. Because what will happen is what you'll, you'll get some Good pictures you're happy with, you'll get closer, you'll get better pictures, you'll get better pictures. At some point in time, uh, animals are really different. Each animal has its own comfort levels and they change from individual to individual. And you may be able to get really close to one animal and not disturb it, but another animal, the closest you might get is 100 yards. So as you take pictures as you approach, if the animal leaves before you got to where you ideally wanted to start really taking good pictures of them, you still have photos of them that you have taken that you can take back with you and it'll be part of your learning experience. Don't surprise them, don't spook them. Make them aware of your presence. Now, when you're losing a lens hood, it's important to use a lens hood to reduce glare and uh, on your lens. When you are using a lens hood, make sure you cover that and cover other shiny parts of your camera or your lens with non-reflective material. So again, some of this camo material that you saw modeled by my friend Nick. Another great way to get wildlife images is, let's say if you're watching a group of caribou or maybe some doll sheep up on a ridge and you see that they're moving in a certain direction, rather than trying to catch up to where they're at now, just simply anticipate where they're going and go there and wait for them. And that way you can just sit and wait and watch as they approach. And most likely you'll get a better photo than if you try to go to the location where they're at right now. When you got to a spot and you are close enough to where you feel like you're gonna get some good photos, while you're observing the animal, just bring up your camera, raise it up and look through your viewfinder and use that opportunity to observe the animal up close but also to just check out your compositions ahead of time. And when you're ready to take a picture, just like you're firing, a, you know, shooting a rifle, you want to breathe in, exhale, slow squeeze. If you have a camera that allows you to do a silent shutter mode, I would engage that. 
because sometimes that clicking noise will disturb an animal and it'll, it'll change the behavior. So everything you can do to do things quietly will also be a better for experience for the wildlife and a better photo for you. Now, of course, when we're taking photos, we wanna do what we can to get a nice, stable, sharp image. A lot of times when we're out there, we're hand-holding. We don't have the luxury of a tripod or a monopod. And in cases of doing photography of marine mammals from a boat, like the picture of this harbor seal here, you don't have the opportunity to set up a tripod because a tripod would be useless on a boat. So you want to handhold. You want to use a fast enough shutter speed for handholding. So the ratio is one to one. For example, if you have a 500 millimeter lens, you want to use a one five hundredth of a second shutter speed as a minimum. If your lens has image stabilization or vibration reduction or your camera does, turn those on. That'll help you get a sharper image while you're hand holding. And uh, if you don't have anything else nearby to help stabilize, a good thing to do is just bring, make sure you, when you're bringing up your camera, press that viewfinder right up against your, the top of the camera right up against your forehead so that it's helping stabilize. And then you're gonna tuck in your elbow against your body and basically helping stabilize just using your own body. <clears throat> but if you do have the ability to use other methods to stabilize, it's very helpful and will help for make sharper images. Common thing we might do in Alaska for driving around is uh, why just use our car as a blind. If you see a moose alongside the road, just pull over and just stay inside your vehicle and you can just roll down your window and shoot from inside. What I like to do is have a bean bag in my car where I'll put the bean bag on the window, on the window, basically the uh, open window on the frame and I'll just lean my lens on that and take a picture. But when possible, I do like to use at minimum a monopod if I'm out on a boat. And particularly um, if I'm waiting at a long time at a, one location for an animal, like if I'm photographing moose during the fall rut, I, if I'm standing around for a long period of time, a tripod is really handy because it has your lens and your camera up and ready to go. And my camera is sliding down here. Pardon me. It's up and ready to go, and you don't have to hold on to it for long periods of time. That lens, that camera can get really heavy. So if you have a tripod handy, you can just have it sitting there waiting for when it's time to use it. A real good rule of thumb is if you can, get at the eye level of your subject when possible. I know sometimes it's not possible, but when it is possible, do it. Like for this photo of this black oyster catcher here, I was literally lying on my stomach on the ground on the shore to get at eye level with him. Eyes are the most important part of wildlife photography. Eyes create a connection and they are basically windows into you know, that animal's uh, personality, uh, what kind of, uh, you know, what, what's it all about? It's something that's very natural that we connect with. So when you are composing your image and when you're focusing, that is a number one thing to make sure is in focus is the eyes because we all naturally connect with eyes. Now, there are a lot of different ways to take pictures of wildlife and I like to vary my approach in how I include the animal in the scene. Very common thing is to do kind of an intimate portrait where the animal is filling most of the frame, sometimes even a tighter shot than this, because you're really just trying to make a study of that animal to get a sense of, of what kind of creature it is and to connect with it. But I like to also include the animal in the landscape because for me, as a naturalist trying to better understand the animal, its behavior, its habitat, I want to tell a little bit of a story about it by showing it in its environment. Animals are not disconnected from where they live. They are intimately connected. You know, a great example of that is um, Amy Gulick's book, Salmon in the Trees, about the, the importance of salmon in the ecosystem and how bears transport the, the salmon to bring nutrition to the trees. Really cool story. Now, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the specific published ethical guidelines about appropriate lens choices. 
if you're going to be photographing, for example, this eagle with its chicks in a nest, you should not be using a 20 millimeter lens. That gets into one of the no-nos I mentioned earlier about photographing from inside a nest. You cannot get this shot without being right there in the face of this eagle. So instead, I used a 500 millimeter lens so I could shoot from a comfortable distance where I wasn't disturbing the animal and interfering with its natural life cycles. That's a big important thing because using a long lens is going to allow you to observe from a safe distance where the animal is comfortable, but you're also going to be able to get some great photos. Want to get opportunities to see that animal behaving naturally. We can get really great action shots like a couple of adult polar bears sparring in the Cactobic Lagoon up in northeastern Alaska, or some young brown bear cubs sparring, which is kind of part of their normal life cycle. This is what young bears do, this is how they socialize. Or to get photographs of subjects you would not be able to photograph because you can't get closer to them because they're out in the middle of the water. Or it wouldn't get safe to get close to them because you, want to get, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near this little spring brown bear cub to get this photo uh, with a wide angle lens. You want to take this from a nice safe distance where a mama bear doesn't come after you. And in the process, hopefully, you are from a nice safe distance where you can observe the animal and you're going to get all kinds of opportunities to photograph natural behavior and that animal could just continue on with its daily routine, uh, sometimes not even knowing you were even really there. Now, a lot of people want to know, where, where do I get started? How do I get started in wildlife photography? Well, we're really lucky here in Anchorage where we have a lot of opportunities where literally you can just start in your backyard. Now, I've lived um, pretty much all over this city. Uh, the two areas I've lived the longest was one down by Jewel Lake, and then up here, I live in the hillside on the south side of Anchorage. So I've been really lucky to live in locations that have a lot of diversity in wildlife. And here, for example, a snowshoe hare photographed in my yard up here on the hillside. Uh, the left photo, their winter colors, and the right photo just recently as we were transitioning from winter to spring, and as you can see, he's transitioning from winter colors to the summer brown colors. Of course, we have a lot of moose in Anchorage, so there are a lot of great opportunities to photograph moose in our backyards. Uh, we have a ton of birds here. This is a, an incredible birding paradise if you're really into watching birds from corvids, like my favorite, the Stellar's Jay, to a variety of raptors from northern hawk owls to goshawks and and great horned owls and a variety of different birds. Bald eagles nest just up the hill from here. Uh, songbirds, you know, tree swallows, just tons of options available. <clears throat> but I wanna share a little bit of a story about these kind of studying wildlife and doing observations in order to get good results in your backyard. So here's some video. We have six wildlife cameras on our property. And you may have heard a lot of people talking about seeing lynx on the hillside at Anchorage. And lynx follow the life cycles of snowshoe hare, which is their primary food source. So the lynx population peaks with the snowshoe hare population. So we've been seeing lynx around our property a lot this winter because of these cameras, and it gave me a chance to observe them. Now in this frame, if you see in the back right hand corner, there's the lynx out in the middle of a trail that goes through our alder. And over a period of a few weeks, I got to see enough to where most of the time when this family of five lynx, one adult and four juveniles, pass through our yard, they always follow the same path across this trail that goes through the alder in our backyard. So I set up a camping chair out there and I spent a couple days actually just sitting and waiting and that didn't produce any results. So one day I was up snow blowing, uh, snow blowing in our driveway and I saw a snowshoe, a correction, a lynx walking up the road. And I knew that the family always traveled together. So I thought, well, maybe they're gonna come through the backyard, the rest of them. So I went to my chair and there I am sitting there and boom, all of the other members of this lynx family all crossed right in front of me, maybe about 40 feet away over the next 20 minutes. And I was able to finally achieve something I have been trying to for years, which is to get a really good shot of a Canada lynx. 
And it was from my observation and understanding and learning the behaviors of these animals as they pass through this particular location that allowed me to anticipate and get ready for and photograph them when the opportunity finally presented itself. And there's one of the many shots I took of these guys as they passed through our backyard. So, bad behavior. There's plenty of it out there. Um, I imagine you've all have seen them, the videos, whether it's some dude walking up too close to a moose and getting knocked at um, in some neighborhood, or I saw one recently of somebody on a boat tossing up fish to an eagle that was flying overhead. Unfortunately, bad examples abound. And one of the big areas that people do bad things when it comes to photographing wildlife is feeding them. Now, in Alaska, it's actually illegal to feed these types of wildlife that are mentioned in this uh, part of the Alaska regulations. Moose, deer, elk, sheep, so that would be dull sheep, bear, wolf, co wolf, coyote, fox, wolverine, or what they call deleterious exotic wildlife. So, uh, invasive species that are starting to make their presence in Alaska, and we don't want to feed them and encourage them, like starlings. So I want to talk about two specific examples that are well known. One in Alaska, uh, Jean Keene, the Eagle Lady, she was very celebrated, widely loved. She lived down in the Homer Spit at a trailer out there in the Homer Spit, and she started feeding eagles in the 1970s. Now, there was actually a law passed in the 1970s, a federal law called the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. It's actually illegal under federal law, under that, on the regulations under that act, because one of the illegal behaviors is altering the feeding habitats of eagles, which she was doing. Then the city of Homer banned the practice of feeding eagles in 2006 but they allowed her to continue to do it until she passed away in 2009. In her heyday, she was feeding roughly 200 eagles a day, some 500 pounds of food. And her behavior spread out to others. I mean, there's a reason why Homer City had to pass this ordinance in 2006, because other photographers, seeing what she was doing, were buying herring and then going out to the end of the spit and tossing it in, into the water to get pictures of eagles catching fish for their wildlife portraits. Now, aside from it just being illegal and bad behavior, there were some specific negative consequences to the ecosystem. First, it habituated the eagles so that when she passed away, Homer was so concerned about how badly the eagles would fare because she wasn't feeding them anymore, they continued the feeding program for another winter. <clears throat> Another thing this did is it brought in a, a large number of predators that weren't normally there as part of the ecosystem, and this impacted other species that became overpredated as a result of the high volume of the eagles that were living in Homer on the spit because they were being fed. Now this gets to the in, intersection of social media and its role in not only promoting but celebrating bad behavior. There's a guy who calls himself the Squirrel Whisperer. He's a Finnish photographer named Konsta Punka. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But he currently has 1.3 million followers on Instagram. If you look at his Instagram feed, it's full of images like this of him hand feeding wildlife to get these intimate portraits of them. And he says that he likes to build trust with them by feeding them. No, you can build trust with them just by observing them and them getting used to you and you not interfering with their natural cycles. That builds trust. Feeding them habituates them and makes it dangerous for them and for other people. There are other evils. There's a whole slew of things that people do um, that unfortunately is kind of a byproduct of this social media frenzy where I saw this great shot that somebody else had, now I need to get it, and it just kind of spirals out of control. Crowding the animal, uh, photographing insides of nests and dens is unfortunately common. Using calls to attract an animal, like doing the moose call during the fall rut to bring out a bull, or using a male, a, um, 
male mating or a, a female's mating call for a bird to bring in a colorful male bird to get a good photo of them. Chasing animals, uh, whether it's out in a boat, you've seen a mantle uh, like a moose crossing a lake and you're chasing it with a boat to get up close to it. Another thing that you might see people doing is, oh, look, I'm driving through Broad Pass on the Parks Highway, heading up towards Denali National Park, and I see a big group of caribou up ahead. Oh, and they're really perfectly positioned right now, but I better speed up to 85 so I can get there and get the shot before they move on. Screech to a halt, make all this noise, and you just create a disturbance and it bothers them. Don't try to be insta-famous. Um, there are a lot of people out there that really are driven by how popular they become on social media, whether it's Facebook, it's Instagram. Um, just don't do it. Just follow the, the practices I mentioned earlier on uh, following an animal, observing it, learning their behavior, being patient with your wildlife photography. Your work can speak for itself. Don't try to copy what other people are doing and don't try to do the newest sensational thing, which then contributes to all these other problems I mentioned in the previous slide. Particularly, <clears throat> when you are gonna post on social media, do not report specific locations for dens or nests or wallows. Uh, now dens or nests, we all know what those are. I mentioned what a wallow is. That's the area where the, the bull moose is digging in the ground and, and peeing. Moose are particular to using the same areas to create wallows year after year after year. So it's a location that they regularly use. So if you report that location to others, then it may cause changes in behavior. Now I've actually seen this happen where there, there was a particular trail in the hillside area in Anchorage. There used to be these really well used wallow sites but over time, people started to spend a lot of time diverting off the main trail to go to these wallow sites. And now those wallow sites have been abandoned and they've moved farther away. So that changed the behavior of the animal. If you are gonna talk about locations where you're seeing wildlife regularly, be vague about it. Like, oh, Anchorage Hillside or Chugach State Park or Turning an Arm. Don't say specifically, oh yeah, there's this group of doll sheep that's been hanging out every day at Windy Point on turning an arm. And then if you do wanna share locations because you, you want to share the knowledge with others about this great wildlife opportunity, just make sure to share it in person with someone that you trust, someone that you know shares the same values and ethics as you, and you know that the animal will not be harmed as a result of sharing that location with someone else. Now, <clears throat> how on earth do you pursue a career in wildlife photography? Well, I'll tell you straight off. You're not going to look in a college directory and find a degree for wildlife photography. You're not going to do a job search. You're not going to look in the wanted ads uh, for wildlife photographer. You have to basically create your own path there. Fortunately, there's no one path. There's a lot of different ways you can get there. There's no required education. In fact, um, uh, as I'll point out on my next slide, you don't even need to get a degree in photography to become a successful wildlife photographer. What you instead, instead need is a good foundation of, wild, of photography principles. So take some photography classes, take some graphic design classes, because that also blends well with photography in helping with composition but you wanna get a good understanding of the camera and how to use it effectively as a tool. Aside from that, you wanna pursue degrees that will help you get careers that will put you in the field where animals will be. Environmental education, wildlife biology, conservation biology. Those will get you jobs that will give you access and exposure and expand your knowledge and opportunities for wildlife photography. So for example, even while you're in college, a lot of park ranger jobs are seasonal jobs. Um, interpretive rangers, um, outdoor guides. These are seasonal jobs you can do during college or immediately after college that'll start to give you exposure and experience in observing and photographing wildlife. Get a job as a naturalist, uh, outdoor 
you know, experiential camps, summer camps, places like Camel Creek uh, Science Center, or get a job as a wildlife biologist working for the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. If you're working as a wildlife biologist, it will help you specialize in particular animals. Most, most wildlife biologists are generalists, but still, depending on what level of degree you get, you'll have to do, like if you're getting a, a master's or a PhD, you'll have to do a dissertation of some time that focuses on a particular type of animal. So it'll help you specialize in the animal. And then now with this job, at least in your early career, most of these types of jobs will put you in the field for the work you're doing. You're not gonna be a bureaucrat fresh out of college. You're gonna be working in the field. So this is gonna give you a chance to be out there and exposed to their habitats and their behaviors and give you a chance to become a wildlife photographer, taking images to build up your portfolio, build up your experience and your exposure. Now, I wanna highlight some internationally famous wildlife photographers. And just to show you that not a one of them got a degree in photography. Paul Nicklin, uh, his degree was in wildlife biology. Franz Lanting, he has degrees in economics and environmental planning. Amy Vitale, hers was in international studies, but that got her traveling international, so she is an internationally oriented wildlife photographer. And then Tom Engelson, who kind of uh, coined the famous shot of the brown bear standing on top of Brooks Falls with the salmon jumping up. Everybody's been trying to copy him since. He got a degree in biology as well. And that's how all these folks got started is with educations and careers that got them out in the field and gave them the exposure they needed to become better naturalists and then ultimately better photographers. Well, that's the, the end of Carl's uh, presentation. So we can go ahead and take questions right now remember go ahead and type them in the chat box and since that takes a moment i'll go ahead and you know say our thank yous real quick um i just want to say thank you to carl for volunteering his time tonight to put together this really informative and really beautiful all these beautiful images that he's taken over his career of our, our great alaskan wildlife um we really appreciate all the time that you put into that and um i personally carl really appreciated you tying in being a good wildlife photographer with being a good naturalist and, and really bringing that back. Um, that, that's a really great message, I think, to have. Um, I also wanted to thank all of the Alaska Wildlife Alliance members and supporters. It's, you know, without your donations, we could not put on these types of educational programs. And so we really thank you. And then for everyone who participated in uh, tonight, uh, we really appreciate that you care about Alaska's wildlife. And um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I do have a question for you, Carl. Uh, what is your educational background? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I was even farther afield than the folks that I highlighted in that slide. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in political science. And my graduate degree, I went to law school. So I actually came to Alaska to practice as an attorney. Um, and was doing photography off the side of just something I enjoy. But now I'm a full-time photographer. So our first question, Carl, is which is the best lens to have mounted on your camera on photography trips? Okay. Um, the lens depends on the wildlife. So for good birding photography, you need to have a long lens, uh, 500 millimeters or longer. If you want a good general wildlife lens, like if I'm going to Denali National Park and I want to be ready to photograph doll sheep or moose or caribou, these are all relatively larger animals. Uh, occasionally get lucky and photograph a red fox or an Arctic ground squirrel. Generally, I would take two lenses with me for that, my 70 to 200 millimeter, and then I'll take a 200 to 400 millimeter which gives me a good range to be ready. And the handy thing is, when you're riding the bus system in Denali, what I'll do is I'll have two different camera bodies, one with each of those two lenses, so that I'm ready and prepared for anything that might be close to the road, because sometimes you'll have a, a brown bear and her cubs walking right on the road, for, and I'll use my 70 to 200 for that. But if there's a couple of large bulls about 100 yards away, then I'll have my longer lens available for that. 
Okay, the next question. How do you go about finding an ethical guide or photo tour? Um, well, you know, um, look at their website. Um, look at their website and their social media feed. See how they present animals and wildlife photos. See what kind of information they share about them. And see if they have displayed on their website any of those uh, organizations that I mentioned earlier, the North American Nature Photography Association and the Nature First logo. If they have those logos, then you know they're aware of those ethical guidelines and that they are hopefully following them. But by studying how they present wildlife and how they talk about them, if they're sharing information that I've told you you shouldn't share, then perhaps they're not an ethical photographer. Well, that's a good, good, uh, good point there. And if you're local to the Anchorage area, there's a, a company I think called Alaska Photo Tracks that might be ethical photographers, maybe <laughs> Carl. <laughs> yes, uh, and 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 that's one of the things I do. I do kind of give some bullet points of some of these things that I've talked about tonight during our tours, and and I will I will tell guests, you know, we've designed our vans so we can roll down. The slide and open the windows and shoot from inside the van. I'll tell them the, the technical advantage for that because like with moose that puts you at eye level. It's a great place to, to photograph them. But also by staying in the van, we're not going to disturb the animal. Moose are used to us pulling over in Anchorage. That's what we do. People pull over and they take pictures of moose through their windows with their cell phones. So the use of that. But once you get out of a vehicle, that's when the moose start to get spooked. So I, I tell these things to our guests to let them understand why we're doing things. And I've actually told guests, no, we are not going to do X because that'll harm the animal. Good to know. Okay, next question um, says, thanks for the excellent presentation. Do you have any suggestions for differentiating wolf from coyote pups? Ha! Uh, wolf and coyote pups? No, but uh, you can identify the, the adults that are going into the den or being near them and that's how you differentiate what the pup is <laughs> and there's definitely some really good um, ID guides out there on the internet to distinguish between wolves and coyotes wolves are considerably larger than coyotes coyotes have a much more narrow profile in their heads their faces uh, they're really distinct but it's a good thing to get out there and find some of those sources so you can identify the adults. And if you do, then you can identify the pups. Okay, your next comment is asking Carl, if you were an artist in resident in the Arctic, is that right? Uh, yeah, I was an artist in residence at uh, Gates of the Arctic National Park. So the follow on question is, what was one of the most memorable animals or landscapes you saw there? Well, uh, that residency introduced me to and made me fall in love with the Arctic. Um, I'm fascinated with the Arctic uh, such that I've now traveled to Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, trying to get as much as I can of the Arctic. I love the, the treeless uh, Arctic tundra landscape. It's just never ending. Um, the light up there is amazing. The quality of light is just otherworldly. You don't think you're on planet Earth when you see beautiful arctic light in the evening as far as wildlife encounters um, for my artist residency um, i did two parts of gates of the arctic i did a base camp at the headwaters of the allotna river uh, for a few days and then we floated down the allotna river and it was during uh, one of our we did a layover camp at a gravel bar on the river and one morning i was pumping water from a, a little stream that fed into the allotna river and I was kind of uh, standing in this shallow area, just basically in the stream, pumping water. And, you know, pumping water is a very monotonous mechanical process. You're just there pumping, pumping, pumping. And you're just kind of like, do, 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 looking around. And I looked to my left, and there was a lone wolf standing on the main gravel bar in this side tributary about 10 feet away from me. <clears throat> And I have no idea how long it had been standing there. And it was just watching me, just staring at me. And uh, like I mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, so I just started talking to the wolf. 
talking to it in a soft monotone voice, telling it how cool it was to see it, and hopefully I wasn't disturbing it. And it was around that time I realized my camera was about 150 feet away over the main part of our campsite. And I thought, well, maybe he'll just stay there long enough and I can get up and I can go get my camera and come back and take a picture. So I got up slowly, I walked towards my campsite and I looked away just for a moment to kind of make sure I wasn't tripping on something. I looked back and he was gone. And I figured out this very spot where I was pumping water was probably his normal route of crossing that, crossing that stream because it's kind of a shallow part in the stream. So that was probably his normal route and I was just in his way and he was just waiting for me to get the heck out of the way. But um, it was one of those times where you, this happens sometimes if you're lucky enough and you're out there in the wilderness and you, you encounter wild animals where you have to balance between the experience of the wild encounter and whether or not you are successful in getting a photograph. And sometimes you just have to let go of taking the photograph and just have the experience. Uh, it's very much like that moment in the movie, uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, where he finds the photographer finally in the Himalayas mm -hmm. and he's, this photographer has gone all the way up there to take a picture of a snow leopard and he finally sees one and he doesn't take a picture because instead he wants to be in the moment. So that's, that's what I had to take away from that experience. But it was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, that sounds a pretty amazing uh, a moment to savor forever in that regard. Um, okay, next question. How can I use my photos to support conservation efforts? That is an excellent question. Um, so this is something that um, I've been doing for most of the time. This camera is driving me nuts. I gotta get this down again. <laughs> I've been doing most of my time living in Anchorage. Um, and again, it came from studying other photographers, what they did and really respecting what I was seeing other photographers doing and using their photography to promote conservation. Um, Jim Brandenburg, uh, who is a very well-known former National Geographic photographer, lives in Minnesota. He was using his photography in materials that conservation groups were using to brief a, con a committee in the U.S. Senate to stop them from allowing uh, motorized access to the Boundary Waters Canary Wilderness. So that kind of showed me what I could do. So what I've been doing is donating my images to local conservation organizations and letting them use them however they can to promote their message. Photography is a powerful tool for conservation because it shows people things and it, sees, it helps them see things they, they've never seen before, might not ever see, but gives them a chance to understand what's at stake. So organizations like the Alaska Wildlife Alliance, look at what they're doing. What are the kind of their main things that they are messaging on? And think to yourself, well, do I have anything that might help their message? Or look at the Alaska Center or the Alaska chapter of the you know, uh, National Parks Conservation Association. We have a lot of great organizations here and they all have mission areas they're focusing on. Visit their websites, see what the mission areas are and see what you can do to help give them some photos they can use. That's a great place to start. Well, and I feel obligated to put in a shameless plug here, Carl, that um, if you would want to donate any photos to Alaska Wildlife Alliance for us to use, we would be glad to have them. <laughs> I will be happy to, and I have in the past, so I'll be happy to keep doing that. Yeah, they're, they're just, they're beautiful photos. So, okay, we have uh, one more question. Uh, do you consider flash okay for non-nocturnal birds? It depends. Um, I'd say most commonly I see flash used with bird photography. Um, and, and really the only way you can effectively use flash is if you get a device called a better beamer that attaches onto the flash. And basically it's like a big uh, magnifying lens that helps boost the effective distance of that flash. I have observed people use this with birds and I have not observed the birds being disturbed by it. But what I would do is just part of your studying the wildlife and its behavior, see if there is any literature out there about the impacts of artificial flash lighting on the subject and 
you know, study that first before using it. Okay, thank you so much, Carl. I'm not seeing any more questions. There are some thank yous that have popped up. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and end our session. I wanna thank you, Carl, for the presentation and the wonderful photos. Great way to spend the past hour looking at beautiful wildlife photos and learning um, the great message you have on being a good naturalist to be a good wildlife photographer. It's really exciting and it's encouraging to know that even though you may feel like you went to school for a certain career field, <laughs> in your case, law school, you can still do something so amazing and get out and, and have these wonderful moments with wildlife. Well, it's thank so you. Fun. It's It's been a real pleasure and uh, just thanks for the opportunity to let people know more about this and what they can do to be a good wildlife photographer. And uh, Nicole, did you want to say any closing remarks? If you do, you're on mute. Great. I just wanted to echo what's been said. Carl, uh, if you haven't had a chance to look more extensively as, at his resume, it's really astounding. Um, lots of different conservation awards, amazing trips, amazing photos. So, um, I would just like to say we're so honored to have your time, Carl, because you've done so much for the conservation community in a lot of different aspects, photography being only one of them. So um, <laughs> thank you so much and uh, give Alaska Photo Treks a visit. If you're, if you're thinking, Carl, um, I think is available by email for any other questions, then yep. um, hopefully we'll see you all around photographing our wildlife. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again. Yep. And um, we would love before everybody signs off, if you would just let us know where you're joining us from in the chat box. Um, we had folks previous sessions as far as from Tokyo and LA and Colorado. So we just love to know where folks are calling in from or joining us from. And with that, thank you very much. I'll stay on the line a few minutes so we can um, see who, where everybody's from, but I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, we will get this presentation posted um, online soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.